So there isn't a footballing fan in the world that doesn't know the name Diego Maradona. He's arguably football's most famous name of all time. Think about those goals in Naples for Napoli, all the way to that hand of God goal against England. But what most people don't know is about his humble beginnings, and it all started here at the home of Argentinos Juniors in Buenos Aires. And in this two-part series, we're going to be learning more about this historic club and how it played a crucial role in the life of one of footballing's greats. To find out more about the club, I've met up with Tomas, a lifelong fan of the club who knows just about everything about it and Maradona. He'll be teaching us about the club's history, its stadium and why it's such an important place in the history of the Argentinian game. Starting with the club's history, it was founded way back in 1904 and like many clubs in Argentina, it has an interesting story behind being created. The club was founded by the merger of two pre-existing sites. One of them was called Sign of Victory and it was composed by socialist players. And the other one was named the Chicago Martyrs. I think that needs no further explanation. They were anarchists, of course, and they merged in order to face a, a stronger team from the neighborhood. So since they defeated it, uh, they decided to remain together. That's why that was when they chose the symbols of the club. First of all, the red color for the jersey, which is the color that, share, that socialists and anarchists share, and then they added a white stripe over the crest because white is the color of international solidarity. So the only thing above the political values is international solidarity. That's the logic behind the emblem. They named the club Argentinos Juniors, despite being anarchists and hating Ar Argentina, of course, <laughs> because it was a way to hide their political belonging. At that time, we were ruled by a very conservative government uh, who was absent of most of the state duties and that also prosecuted and forbid most of the political opposition, including, of course, the anarchists. So they named the club Argentinos Juniors because with the nationalist claim on the name, they thought they could hide from the authorities and because the initials are AAAJ. It stands for Asociación Atlética Argentinos Juniors, but also for Adelante Anarquista Avancemos Juntos, which in Spanish means go ahead anarchists, let's walk together. That was an interesting way to hide it because they couldn't name we are anarchists or we're libertarian or nothing about that. So they had it in a very smart move, I think. In the decades that followed their creation, Argentinos remained a modest club, bouncing between the first and second divisions of Argentinian football, with a third place finish in the 1960 season of the first division being their most memorable result. But this would all change with the discovery of one young footballing talent. Maradona himself came from an area of Buenos Aires called Ficha Ferrito, which is about 16 kilometers from Argentinos' juniors. The story goes that in 1969, a friend of the then eight-year-old Maradona called Goyo Carizzo was already training with Argentinos juniors when then youth coach Francis Cornejo began a hunt for more young talent in the area. It's said that Carizzo, already standing out as a promising player, said to Cornejo that he knew someone even better than him and then he asked if he could bring him along to the following training session. A few days later, Maradona would arrive for a trial, which Cornejo later described as a miracle happening in front of his own eyes, saying, They say people witness at least one miracle in their lives, but most do not realise. I certainly did. My miracle occurred on that rainy Saturday in 1969, when an eight-year-old kid did things with a ball that I'd never seen in my life. So with that, a young Maradona had been discovered. However, in those days of Argentinian football, clubs were prevented from officially signing players under the age of 14 years old. But there was a way around this. By playing under a different name, but still technically under the club's reign, teams could ensure that young talents played within their youth ranks. Therefore, Maradona and his teammates technically played in the youth ranks of Argentina's juniors, up until the age of 14, but did so under the name Los Cebochitas. That translates directly to the Little Onions, which was apparently given to them due to their small statures. But this wouldn't stop them becoming a legendary team. In those early years of Maradona when he led the side, they went on an 100 game unbeaten streak. And you can still see on murals around the local area that that team is very fondly remembered in the club's history. And it was impossible at this time for Maradona's name to not be known amongst locals. And there's even actually photos of him as a ball boy in those early years before he actually made the step up to the first team. 
And on the 20th of October 1976, one of the most important moments in Argentinian football in history would occur when Maradona, just days away from his 16th birthday, would make his league debut against Tajeres de Córdoba. This would be the true start of the legend that was Maradona and he would go on to score 116 goals and claim 40 assists within a five year period for El Bicho and of course made his way into the Argentinian national side for the first time during that period. Despite eventually leaving in 1981, Maradona is still adored at this club and as we'll see this is obvious at the club stadium which is of course named after the great man as the Estadio Diego Armando Maradona. Located in the Buenos Aires neighbourhood of La Paternal, it can currently house 26,000 fans. This is despite the stadium having only three full stands with the area behind one of its goals featuring just a high wall to stop those wayward shots firing into the streets. This is the path the players take to enter to the ground on match days and we have a beautiful image right now because they are watering the grass. But well, this is it. The Diego Armando Maradona Stadium at its best on a very warm day today. Diego is in every single corner of the, of the stadium by the member choice. I think if you ask them, nobody complains. Maybe they say they're not enough. Diego references. <laughs> the stadium itself is named Diego Armando Maradona, but then the terraces, that one is made Garcia Miramon. Garcia Miramon was the president of the club in the 40s and he was responsible of buying this ground with his own money. When he took office, we had no ground because we used to have one five blocks away from here, but it was a rented one and we couldn't afford the rent anymore. We lost it and the landlord kept the items, you know, the iron structure, the wooden stands. So Miramon bought this ground with his own money and then he made an arrangement with the landlord of the other ground to recover it and to rebuild it over here. Unlike most of the terraces in, in Argentinian football, uh, most of, of these ones have no fences. The only one that, uh, that has one is the Garcia Miramon one because that's where the hooligans go. But the thing is that all the others are members only and we know exactly who is in every one of the terraces. It's not common in Argentinian football to have uh, terraces without fences. In every stadium you visit you'll see fences all over the place but not here. And that one, that's exclusive not only for members but for union members. You know, kids that play sports at a sports complex receive complimentary tickets for them and their families, but they don't receive free tickets because they're members already. So a members, ha members have the right to come to the stadium in every match, but they receive complimentary tickets for their parents in order to tighten the link mm -hmm. between the local community and the club. Inside the stadium, you can find the club's museum, which rich in football and history also houses the holy grail of South American football. This is the Copa Libertadores we won in 1985, being the Latin American counterpart of the Champions League, so big deal. And how come we won this being a humble side of the metropolitan region of Buenos Aires? Well, because we saw Diego. Everybody asks us, how did Diego perform in these Libertadores? And the thing is that Diego never played a single game of Copa Libertadores, not only in Argentina, everywhere. He never played Copa Libertadores in his professional career. His brother did, his brother played for Argentinos in 86. But in 1985, we won this trophy because when we sold Diego to Barcelona in nearly $6 million of the time, we could afford an entire new team. And we could, we could hire the most important coach in Argentina at that time, who was Ángel Labruna, the coach from River Plate. So uh, Labruna arranged a team of stars, some of them true legends like Jorge Olguín or Pato Filiol, world champions in, in 1978 for Argentina. But uh, he merged it with the most important players from the academy, which at that time were the captain, uh, Russo Domenech, the scorer Claudio Borghi and the most importantly the central midfielder Checho Batista. We won this trophy in 1985 in the September was the month and we won the Libertadores in October. One of, we are one of the few South American teams that achieved both the league and the Libertadores 
on the same month, on the same season. Uh, it was, it's not that common because mostly the, the final stages of the domestic championship uh, match uh, the time of the definition of the Libertadores. So if you, won, if you win one, you can't win the other one. Rules are made to be broken, right? We are known the, as the cradle of the legends in Argentinian football, including one, two, three, four world champions. Checho Batista, Alexis McAllister, Diego Maradona himself, and Claudio Borghi. Maradona, Borghi, and Batista were in the 1986 world champions, and McAllister was in 2022s. We have a, a gallery of players from the national team because players really remain linked to, to the club. So we have jerseys from Fernando Cáceres, Lucas Viglia, Esteban Cambiaso, Fernando Redondo, and so on. And we have a gallery of jerseys of Argentinos on that side, all of them much worn by legends of the club. This one is from Lobo Ledesma, and this is from Sergio Batista, when he came back to the club. This one is from Juan Pablo Sorín's uh, last game, uh, his tribute game, one of the most beautiful models ever made by Adidas. Yeah, that's great, that one I love that. Yeah, like the one of, from the Netherlands in 88. Yeah. We used it on the following season. That's an entire room dedicated to Diego here in the Museum of Argentinos. Most of the items we have here are donated by Francis Cornejo's family. Cornejo was the coach responsible for bringing him to the club and to educate him on his first years in professional football. And we are proud of saying, I don't know where the picture is, but there was a picture here, <laughs> um, that Diego was the first visitor that the museum had. The museum was open in 2009, and at that time Diego was the coach of Argentina's national team. He came to the stadium because he was following some players of Argentinos at that time, Juan Mercier, Gabriel Auche, Tato Canuto, and Matias Caruso. And, uh, well, he came to the stadium to a match against Racing. We won 2-0, and we brought, we brought him to the museum. And he said, well, this is nice, but there's nothing mine. And we told him, we told him no, well, Diego, because you must donate it in order to, to, to see it here. And he said, don't worry. He grabbed his phone, he made one single phone call, and the following day we had Francis Cornejo's niece and his hair uh, bringing us most of the stuff you'll see around. So we decided that Diego, of course, deserved a place on the, on the museum, but also that he needed to share this with his sports father, as he called him, Francis Cornejo. You'll see a lot of interesting items over there, all of them belonging both to Diego and Cornejo, and, to, and showing Diego on the media when he was a child, like over here. This is Diego being only 11 years old, playing as a ball boy, or appearing as a ball boy on a match against River Plate. Uh, history says that that match was su such a boring one. Diego, started, Diego came to the, to the ground on the, on the halftime, during the halftime, and he started juggling with the ball. Juggling and juggling and juggling and juggling, and then with his head, and then with his knee, and then with his right, right leg, with his shoulder even. And people started clapping, and when he was leaving, because the second half was beginning, people started to chant, que se quede el pibe, que se quede el pibe, which means, let the lad stay, let the lad stay, because the players were so lousy compared to him that, well, that's when, that was when the legend of Diego started to buzz around, when he was only 10. He was playing for the pre-academy team of Argentinos, Los Cebollitas, and he was uh, already being so uh, being acknowledged by both the media and the fans of Argentinos, who used to go to the sports complex to watch Diego's trainings. This is my personal favorite on the whole tour, which is this, this match ball. Uh, this was used on a match against Huracán, which took place in 1977. Um, Argentinos, uh, face Huracán, which was one of the top teams of the, at the time in Argentinian football. They had very important players like Hector Valli, who was the national team's goalkeeper, later world champion in 78, as a substitute for Pato Filiol. They had uh, Rene Hoseman, one of the forwards of the national team. They had Miguel Brindisi. It was the hell of a team. And, but they had the, maybe their best player was Jorge Carrascosa, whose nickname was the Wolf. You know, mostly friendly players are not nicknamed the Wolf, <laughs> as Carrascosa was. But well, that day Argentinos won 3-0 in an away match at Huracán Stadium, a beautiful palace, Tomás Ducó. Uh, and 
Diego scored two goals and made the assistance for the third one. And the, one of the goals he scored, he claims to has, which has been the best of his professional career. Everybody asks us, even better than the one he scored against England in 86? And we say, definitely yes. First of all, because Diego says so. So, <laughs> if the king speaks. Second, because the people that was there told us it was unbelievable. Third, because, I don't know, this ball weighted maybe half a kilogram or even more. Um, and then because he started, the, the play was quite similar than the one against England, but he started from his own box. He dribbled the same number of players. He left Hector Valli, the goalkeeper, on his way. And then um, Carrascosa came to mark. Carrascosa was a central defender. So when Carrascosa approached him, standing like this, Diego put the ball between Carrascosa's legs. He says he was too afraid of celebrating because there was one reason why Carrascosa was nicknamed the wolf, you know. But Carrascosa is also a gentleman, so he congratulated Diego. He shook hands with Diego. Imagine an opposite player shaking hands with someone that just scored against them at their home. Uh, well, Carrascosa shook Diego's hand. The referee, Teodoro Nitti, which was quite a strict guy, he also shook Diego's hand, and later he gave him the match ball. And even the Huracan supporters started clapping. Sadly, there's, no, there's not the whole footage of the goal, but if you look at it on YouTube, you'll, you'll find the last part in which he leaves Bali on the way and then puts the ball between Carrascosa's legs. That's it for this video, but in the second part of this series, we'll visit the vast array of murals dedicated to Maradona at the stadium, talk with locals who witnessed him play, and of course, get to a game in La Tierra de Dios.